From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, I'm David Weston and welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. I want to start today with a check on the markets. Joining us now is Scarlett Fu. So Scarlett, uh, the markets seem to continue their sell-off after the Fed yesterday, particularly led by tech. Yes, that was certainly the theme yesterday uh, in late trading, and it looked that way at the open as well. But we attempted to stage a bit of a pump comeback. It's kind of fizzled out here, and indexes are still lower. The equal weight S&P 500 is down a lot less than the Nasdaq 100. Six-tenths of 1% for the equal weighted index, which treats every company with the same weighting as opposed to the Nasdaq 100, which is so unduly influenced by those five big tech names. Nasdaq 100 off by 2%. The bottom line here, David, is that the big biggest drags on the market today are the ones that kept pulling the market to new heights in August. You know the names, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, Alphabet. And to some extent, yes, you blame it on the Fed. Uh, S&P 500 futures fell after Jay Powell's news conference and have yet to fully recover. Powell did make very clear that interest rates will stay low at current levels until 2023. But investors were positioned for some kind of a dovish surprise. And there was perhaps disappointment that he didn't provide any further details, new details, further breakdown of the Fed's QE program. Perhaps he's choosing to save that option for later if the economy stumbles. And he made very clear that the Fed has not run out of ammunition yet. The question that everyone's asking, David, is if this tech pullback is a simple correction or something bigger. You look at the S&P 500 equal weighted index down 4% this year. Jack Ablin of Crescent Capital says that suggests the downside risk to the overall market is limited. Yeah, it's an interesting question, positioning yourself for a surprise. I'm not sure if it's a surprise if you're positioned for it. What about other asset classes? Where are we with things like bonds and, for that matter, the right. dollar? Right. Bonds are higher. That's sending yields lower. The dollar has been fluctuating all day long. Credit is down. If you look at LQD, which tracks investment-grade credit, or HYG, which tracks high-yield credit. I'm also looking at Nat Gas because it is tumbling on the latest inventory report. Um, and, of course, this is another asset that's falling from August highs. More than any other asset class, commodities, and especially the energy complex, they move on basic supply and demand dynamics. And here you've got U.S. supplies increasing, and right now with weather turning cooler, reduced re that would reduce demand, and the hurricane uh, in the south knocking on power, that's also going to reduce demand. That means less demand for companies linked to nat gas. You can see EQT, Range Resources, Cabot Oil and Gas, all off. And early on in the session today, David, we did see uh, these names help drag the energy sector to the worst performance among 11 industry groups. All right, thank you so much for being with us. That's Scarlett Fu reporting on the markets. Well, whatever those markets were looking for from the Fed yesterday, I think it's fair to say they didn't get it. Here to go over what the Fed did, and for that matter, what it didn't do, we're joined now by Sarah House, Wells Fargo senior economist. So, Sarah, thank you so much for being with us. Appreciate it. So why would the markets be surprised? I mean, basically, the Fed said we're going to keep it low for a long time. Yesterday, they said we're going to keep it close to zero until 2023. What's surprising about that? Well, we did get some form of forward guidance in terms of the Fed saying that they weren't going to raise rates until you had achieved the maximum employment mandate, that you saw inflation return to 2%. But beyond that, in terms of how much of an overshoot the Fed was looking for, they were still pretty vague and said that they only need to be on track for for inflation to exceed that 2% target when the market might have been looking for something stronger. And when you look at the overall outlook, too, though, with, the, with those extra projections. So they still have inflation returning to, to 2%, but you did see a, a number of, of participants signaling liftoff in, in 2023, even if it wasn't the bulk of the committee. So there, there does seem to be a little bit more of a sway towards towards rates might be rising a little bit faster than 2023 than, than, participants might, than well, market participants might have been expecting. Well, and if you were looking for that, Sarah, you might find it in some of what Jay Powell said, because he said the economy is coming back faster than we expected when we met last time. At the same time, he said the uncertainty really hasn't diminished at all. Maybe it's even gone up. Absolutely. So I think that has been been one of the things we've seen in the economy is that whether it's uh, the outlook for GDP, what we've seen in terms of the labor market, things are getting a bit better more quickly. And we saw that reflected in the economic projections. But when it comes to where we go from from here, there's there's still a lot unknown. So, of course, this still depends very much on the course of the virus. We're heading into the fall and winter months when when things could get a little bit more hairy than they already are. And then when it comes to the, the 
fiscal side of things, uh, you know, I think there were a lot of expectations that we would have gotten a deal by now, but of course that's been, you know, that's fallen to the, to the wayside. And so I think there's, there's uncertainty over that fiscal component that remains in the outlook as well. Well, Sarah, that's what I wonder about really. If you look at it in a larger sense with the Fed, did they have any choice but to sort of stand pat? Because you have the uncertainty over the fiscal stimulus you just referred to, certainly uncertainty about the, the coronavirus, when we get a vaccine, if we get a vaccine. And by the way, there's an election coming up before they meet again. It would have been really, really something to make any sort of a significant move given all that uncertainty. Well, I think if you look at the overall stance of, of the Fed's pos policy position and then what the economy has been doing more recently. So, yes, we're seeing momentum slow, but we're still seeing the, the recovery continue at, at a pretty good pace. And so in some ways, I think the Fed was looking at this in, in terms of maybe saving a little bit of ammo, knowing that what they have left maybe doesn't pack quite as big of a punch as, as what we've already seen. And so given the fact that we continue to see things improve and that we did see the Fed uh, adjust that forward guidance, along with its new framework policy, I think that they, they probably thought that this is enough for now, and we'll see how things evolve in, in the coming months. And, and as Powell emphasized in his press conference, there is some more that they can do still. So, Sarah, let me press you a little bit. What would be the data that might change their minds next time? Well, so I think we've seen this renewed focus on on the labor market in terms of, of that maximum employment goal and really pressing for getting getting the labor market back to the strong position it was in heading heading into the pandemic. And so I think if you saw some notable backsliding in, in the labor market, so we've already seen payroll growth slow. We've seen jobless claims trend only gradually lower. And so I think if you saw some some outright backsliding there, that that could get the Fed to to, to move in terms of more accommodation a, a little a little bit faster. And then I think also if you saw uh, inflation beginning to falter again. So we've seen it pick up over the past couple months. Now some of that's p related to, to the bounce back for the pandemic. But if we see that this overall disinflationary event weighing more on, on inflation, we might see the Fed step up asset purchases, for example, and uh, to get things going again. Sarah, finally, what about the other side of inflation? Some people now are talking about maybe inflation returning. Is the Fed looking at actual inflation or inflation expectations? So they're looking at both. And and I think when we look at the, the upside risks to inflation, that there's cer it's certainly within the realm of possibility if, if you look at the environment we're in today. So you still have some of the structural factors holding down inflation, things like technology. Mm -hmm. You know, in many ways, those have been accelerated by, by the pandemic. But we are in an interesting position where expectations re remain rather low. And so the Fed's been trying to to talk those up to some extent with this, with this new framework. But of course, we've seen massive amounts of stimulus that's landed directly in, in households' banking accounts and, and in business accounts. So it's getting, yeah, it certainly has the potential to be spent more than what we saw um, in terms of the stimulus the the last and during the last downturn. And so there certainly is that that upside risk. But I think that the the Fed is going to wait till they see it. And in many ways, after how low inflation has been the the past decade or so, they would consider that a good problem to contend with. Exactly, a little inflation aver averaging, perhaps. Okay, thanks so much to Sarah mm -hmm. House. She's Wells Fargo senior economist. Coming up here, we're going to talk with Senator Chuck Grassley of Iowa about whether there's a deal to be done on further fiscal stimulus. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We turn now to Mark Crumpton for Bloomberg First Word News. David, thank you. Russia is trying to keep Joe Biden from winning November's presidential election. FBI Director Christopher Wray warned today that Russia is using social media to sow discord in the United States, primarily to hurt Mr. Biden. Director Ray testified to a House Homeland Security Committee today that Russia views Biden as part of an anti-Russian American establishment. Biden says China is also Ray, excuse me, says China is also trying to interfere. Russia Group founder Ian Bremmer says Eurasia Group founder Ian Bremmer says President Trump deserves the Nobel Peace Prize more than former President Obama did when he won it in 2009. Bremmer spoke to Bloomberg Television. I can say he deserves one more than Obama did at the time that Obama received it. Of course, that was a symbolic uh, uh, prize at that point. It was a hopeful prize. It was aspirational and it was overtly political. 
President Trump has been nominated for the Peace Prize for the U.S. brokered agreement between Israel and the United Arab Emirates. U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres is calling on governments to not, quote, throw away economic stimulus funds by supporting fossil fuel industries that contribute to global warming. Speaking at a virtual conference on climate change, Mr. Guterres said investing in renewable energy and green technologies is the only rational path as countries mobilize trillions of dollars for economic recovery in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic. Tropical Storm Sally could drop up to a foot of rain today in parts of Alabama and Georgia. The storm came ashore yesterday as a hurricane near the Florida-Alabama line. At least one person was killed and hundreds more were rescued. Streets were flooded throughout the region. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thank you very much, Mark. Congress has been negotiating over a possible fourth round of fiscal stimulus for months now. And although the White House has signaled it might be able to go along with some version of the compromise that's been proposed by a bipartisan group of congressmen, it's not clear that there are the votes from either the Republicans or the Democrats to get that deal done. Welcome now Republican Senator Chuck Grassley of Iowa. He is chairman of the Finance Committee. So, Senator, thank you so much for being with us. You were outspoken when the Democrats basically blocked an effort to get a trim down, a so-called skinny skin stimulus through the Senate. How do you feel about the $1.5 trillion pro proposal from the House side? Too much, but what's inside is even more disturbing. $500 million for state and local governments to bail out irresponsible fiscal states like Illinois, New York, and California. That would be a big one where there's some agreement is uh, continued use of the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, some money for K through 12 education because uh, controlling the virus in these schools is very expensive and uh, things like that. But uh, the total amount is irresponsible. We still have about several hundred million of the first three trillion that went out uh, that hasn't been spent. So if you got several hundred billion that hasn't been spent, why would you think about spending another one and a half trillion dollars? Uh, so I think the, Demo the Democrats proved a week ago today that they didn't want it in the Senate. And I'll let you ask another question. No, no I was just going to ask specifically on the state assistance. As I understand it, the Democrats were at something like $900 billion. The Republicans were at $100 billion. The proposal came in at like $400 billion. As you said, that's too much. Is anything over $100 billion too much, or is there some leeway there? Well, I think at one time, uh, at least the White House, and they don't speak for uh, Republicans in total, but it was a little more reasonable that maybe doing what we did in March at $150 billion. But for some of us, when that 150, first 150 billion it hasn't been spent in a lot of states, they, they might not even know how to spend it. Uh, you know, what's the reason of pouring more money in where uh, present money hasn't been spent yet? Uh, it just encourages more irresponsible spending. So, as I understand it, that money hasn't been spent in part because there were restrictions placed on what could be done with it. Are you open to relieving some of those restrictions so you can spend the yeah. remaining funds? Yeah. In fact, that was in our bill that we tabled uh, last week of July, and it was also in the skinny, uh, the targeted bill that we voted on last uh, week. And when I say uh, Democrats showed they didn't want to uh, uh, go that direction, they wouldn't even, they said they didn't like it. So if they don't like it, then you get it up and you amend it. They didn't even want to let us get the bill up for discussion and amendment. And, and the people that are really hurt by not doing that, you know, uh, the enhanced federal unemployment ran out July 31st. The president put another $300 into that uh, through uh, his executive order. Uh, and that ran out on September the 8th. So all the Democrats that voted against it a week ago, even bringing the bill up, uh, they were saying to the unemployed people in America, uh, you can't have any more unemployment insurance. 
and uh, that would have been a real opportunity to continue it till the end of the year. So, so talk about that supplemental unemployment insurance because again, uh, originally it was $600 a week, that's gone away as you said, there's the interim $300 that's going away. Uh, as I understand, the proposal now is to do it at $450 a week, sort of in between, for a fixed period of eight weeks. Does that sound reasonable to you? I've talked to people no. at the White House who say they think that might be okay. Uh, I think it's unreasonable. Uh, $600 two-thirds of the people unemployed were making more than if they had working. And then at even at $300, probably 40% uh, of the people still be making more. We've got, we, we should not have a, a federal policy that discourages people from working. And number two, the federal government shouldn't be an unfair competitor against all the small businesses that want to get their people back to work when the federal government will outbid the salaries that small business can pay. Uh, Senator Grassley, uh, in your speaking out against what the Democrats did in killing the, the, the Senate version of this, you said there are some things in there we really need, including, for example, real assistance to farmers who certainly have had a hard time the last few years. Uh, does that appeal to you to say, you know what, maybe we should go farther than I otherwise would because there are things in there I need to get, for example, for the farmers? Well, I, I want to help the farmers with the lowest prices we've had in a long time and, and uh, maybe in uh, 10 years because of the virus. Now, prices are up just a little bit now that it looks a little better, but uh, we can't, uh, we can't uh, to help uh, uh, one group of people, you can't be irresponsible in the others. And I want to tell you how responsible it was with what we wanted to help the farmers. Uh, they're two percent of the population. They provide all the food for the other 98 percent. It was going to be 20 billion dollars out of 300 billion, or out of uh, uh, it was just a little bit more out of the three and three and a half trillion that Pelosi's been pushing. So uh, what farmers are after is a small amount, but you aren't going to be fiscally irresponsible on the other uh, one and a half trillion dollars. I think another thing needs to be said about what the House proposed two days ago, and that is 50 House Republicans and Democrats, bipartisan group, got together and suggested this one and a half trillion that you're uh, bringing up. And then, you know, they went to Pelosi and she turned it down because she wants yet more. So uh, it just proves to you that the few left wing radicals in the House of Re Re Representatives are forcing Pelosi to uh, reject something that's got bipartisan support uh, in the House of Representatives. Uh, Senator, for those of us who are not veterans of that building where you are right now, Capitol, the Capitol of the United States, give us an understanding because we sort of are puzzled, some of us, to say, is the dispute here, as it were, on the merits or is it actually political because of the election? How much of this is gamesmanship trying to figure out who gets credit, who gets blame? Well, polls show that the, uh, what happened last Thursday, that the Democrats are paying a bigger price than Republicans, but that doesn't do much for the people that are hurting at the grassroots of America, but it shows that politics uh, is being put above people. And even re uh, Pelosi rejecting under pressure from the real left-wing radicals in the Democratic caucus and the House of Representatives, uh, she's putting politics above uh, what's good for the people when you reject a bipartisan agreement on something that could probably get a majority vote in the House of Representatives. So let me ask the unfair question. As you look forward, there's going to be a recess soon because people have to go back and campaign. All the House of Representatives, a third of the Senate. What are the chances of getting fiscal stimulus before the election? From one to a hundred, what do you put it at? Zero, unless Pelosi decides she needs something. She's going to have to sit down with the White House. But the White House has been making some statements here recently that would never get a, 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 a hardly any Republicans in the House in the United States Senate. So this used to be the White House versus Pelosi uh, up until about now. Hmm. Now the president's coming in and saying we can maybe go to one and a half trillion. Uh, he better be careful of that because I don't think that bill could get through the United States Senate.
That's really helpful and really interesting. Thank you so much, Senator. And by the way, happy birthday. As I understand, it's a special day for you, and we'd be remiss if we didn't wish you a really great day. I hope it's good for you. That's Senator Whoa. Chuck Grassley, Chairman of the Finance Committee. And coming up tomorrow, we're going to get the Democratic perspective with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It is time now for the stock of the hour. Oracle is getting closer to a U.S. deal for TikTok, as the company and Chinese partner ByteDance are said to have agreed on terms with the Treasury Department. Scarlett Fu is here with all the details. So what's going on, Scarlett? Well, Oracle did briefly pair its decline on that headline, but if you look at it over the past two days, it is still in the red. We've seen Oracle shares, of course, advance to a record high on this TikTok adventure. So the story continues. Now, the latest reports, David, all in indicate that the parties involved, and we're talking about Treasury, Oracle, and TikTok's Chinese parent ByteDance, are that much closer to some kind of deal or partnership. And according to Reuters, one of the Treasury's conditions is that U.S.-based investors will own a majority of TikTok. That would cover Oracle, Walmart potentially, and ByteDance's existing U.S. investors. And of course, this is one of the White House's biggest sticking points, that it cannot remain a Chinese government-run company. President Trump had highlighted that as a threat to U.S. national security. Oracle, of course, has to walk a pretty fine line here because it needs both Washington and Beijing's approval for its bid. Uh, Tr the Trump administration has gotten a lot more stringent with its approval of deals, uh, particularly when it comes to any involvement with China. You can see over the years that uh, the cases reviewed have gone down, but there have been a lot more uh, objections raised, especially high-profile deals. Now, our understanding is that Oracle's original bid includes access to review TikTok's uh, algorithms and updates, but not outright ownership of the technology. So, Scarlett, do you have any sense of the extent to which the rest of the tech world is looking at this? That is to say, if we got peace in our time between U.S. and China on this TikTok deal, would other, would other tech companies breathe a sigh of relief? I don't know that anyone's thinking that per se. I mean, the Trump administration um, and President Trump is going to always be looking very carefully at anything that has to do with China. It's it's a it's it's not I don't want to use the word enemy, but it's an antagonist for him. Right. So he is going to always be focused on that. And I think they just kind of want to keep their head under um, under the radar and, and proceed as normal. Um, a lot of the discussion when it comes to Oracle is how much of, of an advantage it might enjoy because it counts the U.S. government as a big customer. And also Larry Ellison, the mm -hmm. founder and chairman of Oracle, is known as a friend of President Trump, uh, donating to his mm -hmm. campaign and, of course, hosting fundraisers for him as well. Yeah, President Trump has said as much in the past few days. Thank you so much to Scarlett Fu for that report on Oracle and the TikTok deal. Up next, let's get ready for more taxes as New Jersey decides on new taxes for those making more than a million dollars. And presidential candidate Joe Biden has his own plans for higher taxes for the entire country. We're going to talk with Jeannie Zeno, our political contributor. That's coming up on Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we turn now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. President Trump would support narrow legislation to provide more financial help to airlines as they try to recover from the coronavirus pandemic. That's according to White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows after a meeting with industry executives today. Meadows says the industry needs $25 billion and that 30,000 to 50,000 jobs are at risk. Airlines, including United and American, have warned they plan mass layoffs in October. Global health officials are warning of what they call alarming rates of transmission of the coronavirus in parts of Europe. The European head of the World Health Organization says the biggest jump has been in adults aged 25 to 49. He called for regions to work together in their virus response plans. COVID-19 has killed more than 226,000 people across Europe. Britain is imposing tougher virus restrictions as the country tries to stem the spread of COVID-19 before the colder winter months. The new measures include restrictions on social gatherings and ordering bars and restaurants to close early. Opposition lawmakers have criticized Prime Minister Boris Johnson's handling of the crisis and said his government lacks a cohesive plan to tackle a second wave of the pandemic. 
The Justice Department explored whether it would pursue either criminal or civil rights charges against city officials in Portland, Oregon, after clashes erupted there between law enforcement and demonstrators. A spokesperson declined to say whether charges will actually be filed. President Trump has blamed Democrats and specifically pointed to Portland's mayor, Ted Wheeler, who he says have not done enough to stop nights of looting and unrest in cities across the United States. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David. Thanks very much, Mark. It's election season and taxes are very much on the agenda, with President Trump insisting we need more tax cuts and former Vice President Biden saying we need to go the other direction so we can invest in the future. In the meantime, Governor Phil Murphy of New Jersey reached agreement with legislative leaders on a so-called millionaire's tax for his state. What does all this mean politically? Well, we welcome now our political contributor, Jeannie Zeno. She's professor of political science at Iona College. Jeannie, always a treat to have you here. So what about this tax issue? Because it seems to be real this time. It does. And it's, you know, third time's a charm in New Jersey. They were able to get a deal. We're hearing on this what they call the millionaire's tax. But, of course, it took three times, and it also took a pandemic and some pretty difficult fiscal times in New Jersey for them to reach this deal, which Governor Phil Murphy has been pushing for. But the Democratic legislature has held off on this. But at this point, we're hearing that they are going to raise for residents making more than a million dollars a year to a higher tax rate. Um, and they're also in, in part in that deal is going to be a recurring $500 a $500 year rebate for families with one child and an income of less than 150000 if they're a couple or 75000 if they're single. So they are, have struck this deal, and I think it's probably a precursor of debates we're going to hear going on in the states, depending on what happens in November. I think in particular of New York State, where the Democratic governor has resisted this call, but it's going to certainly gain momentum following New Jersey. Does it affect voters, particularly if they think they're not going to get taxed because they don't make more than a million dollars a year? Yeah, I, I absolutely think that for Democrats in particular, this is a welcome move in New Jersey. But I think you hear it from Republicans and you hear it from moderates and independents. They fear that it's going to lead to an exodus of the highest earners in the state. And that has itself profound tax implications for the state. So, you know, there's two sides to this story. And I do think it's something voters are going to keep in mind as they head to the polls. You're hearing Bernie Sanders saying Joe Biden needs to focus more specifically on the economy and how he is going to be a different voice than a President Trump on that issue. And, of course, Joe Biden has made this case, but probably not as specifically as somebody like Sanders or Elizabeth Warren may have, and he certainly isn't going as far as they would have. And so it's still a contentious issue on the Democratic side. We'll talk about uh, former Vice President Biden and President Trump and where they stand right now. We've got another Monmouth poll out this morning saying that, in fact, uh, uh, Mr. Biden is ahead of Mr. Trump by four points, it appears, in the state of Arizona, a critical swing state, I should say. Yeah, absolutely. So Joe Biden still appears to be ahead, although, as you mentioned, there is about six critical states in which this election is likely to be decided. And I'm sure you'll have nightmares about this, but Florida is starting to look like it may all come down to Florida once again. Um, Arizona, certainly a key state, North Carolina, and then, of course, the Midwest um, states, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Those six, and one of the markers of that is the fact that the campaigns and their allies are spending most of their money, eight, some, somewhere upwards of 80 percent plus, in those six states as we march, you know, less than 50 days to the election. And Joe Biden still has about, in leaning states, 268 uh, electoral votes. But once again, Donald Trump is very, very close in these swing states. And as he did last time, if he runs the table, he could win those key states and pick up, a, you know, an enormous win in the Electoral College. Close us out here, Jeannie, if you would, with down ballot. It looks like Senator Collins might be in trouble over Maine. We, we actually had remarkable report, actually, that Lindsey Graham may be tied uh, down in South Carolina. And then, of course, you have McSally against Kelly out in Arizona. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we're seeing Susan Collins. She's down about 12 points in Maine. Lindsey Graham, who once, you know, this was a long shot for Democrats, is now looking to be tied with his challenger. And then, of course, you go out to Arizona and Kelly doing very, very well out there. So 
this looks like the Democrats could, on the down ballot, take the Senate. And as we swing back to thinking about tax changes at the federal level, it would require not just a Joe Biden victory, but Democrats taking the Senate for any concerted change in the tax policy. So those down ballot races matter an awful lot from a policy perspective. And from your historical perspective, how important is the, the coattails issue there? That is to say, does the chance of the challenge, the Democratic challenger, go up significantly if, in fact, President Biden wins the presidency? Yeah, you know, it does. There is a big coattail effect. If you get a huge turnout on either side, you're likely to see voters not just vote for the top of the ticket, but vote for Senate, House, and down the state lines. So that's really important, and a big Joe Biden turnout could switch the Senate. It's very, very close at this point, and we're seeing Republicans very nervous. And, of course, Democrats trying to push through on these states where they now have a shot. Six months ago, we didn't think they had a shot of taking the Senate. Fascinating. Thank you so much. Always a treat, as I say, to have Jeannie Zeno with us. She's our Bloomberg political contributor. Coming up here, we're going to take a look at the swing state of Arizona through the eyes of its former governor, Jan Brewer. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. There is no single vehicle more important for Ford Motor, or for that matter, for the North American auto business overall, than the Ford F-150 pickup. This fall, it's undergoing a complete makeover, and Ford is giving it an all-new production home in the process. We talked earlier today with Ford's president for North America and the International Markets Group. He is Kumar Kohotra about the big changes at Ford. We're going to have uh, autonomous guided vehicles that the, 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 the F-150 will sit on that'll go from station to station. It gives us a lot more flexibility in terms of how we process the line, in terms of how we process each workstation. And that's just the part of the assembly line. And then the tools that are used to assemble the vehicle are much smarter. Uh, the tools can detect uh, if there is a fault in the uh, in the process while they're assembling the vehicle. So it's a very unique combination of smart tools and a smart assembly line that gives us a lot of flexibility and makes the entire process uh, much more efficient and, and higher quality. Much more efficient, much higher quality. What does it do to the workforce? Do you not need as many workers as a practical matter in this new way of assembling? Oh, no, we, we're still creating lots and lots of jobs in this country. So this particular uh, a, a small plant that we're building next on this large complex for battery electrics will add 300 jobs uh, to, to the local economy. But that's just those are just the jobs in this particular complex. Uh, the ripple effect that our industry and our company has is quite enormous. Uh, for every one uh, worker that builds, for example, uh, an F-150, it comes into one of our F-150 plants, there are probably 14 to 15 other jobs that are created as a, as a result. Uh, for example, the overall F-150, or F-series, I should say, we build in four different assembly plants, uh, over uh, nearly 20,000 workers. But if you look at the ripple effect that has, uh, that's nearly half a million jobs uh, throughout the country. So we are very committed to the manufacturing base and, and creating jobs uh, every day. Uh, for example, our present contract with our union, UAW, goes from 2019 to 2023. During that period, we expect to create approximately 8,500 jobs uh, in between that uh, and during that contract. So very committed still to the, uh, to the American manufacturing base. You mentioned the all-electric F-150 that I think doesn't come out until 2022, but you're building a factory there to actually produce that vehicle. Explain that vehicle to us, and how is it going to stack up against some of the competition that already is moving along? We have the Tesla Cybertruck, for example, that's going to be sometime late in 2021. Yeah, so there, there's obviously various sub-segments to this large segment called pickups. The, there are competitors who are looking at more of a, uh, I would say, a lifestyle, lifestyle truck. Uh, but there's a very large segment for work trucks. Uh, we did a lot of research. We know our customers very well. Uh, our customers are looking for a vehicle that they can count on to do specific jobs. 
uh, and, and that's what we're focused on. Uh, they're very focused on total cost of ownership, for example. So an F-150 battery electric total cost of ownership will probably be in the neighborhood of you know, 40 to 50% lower than a traditional pickup truck. So cost of ownership is important. Uh, the availability of power is important. Uh, with an all electric F-150, you can have up to 10 kilowatts of power available. You can power a whole job site. You can power all your tools. Uh, we're going to have a, what, what some people are calling a frunk uh, because once you remove the engine and the transmission from the front, there's a substantial room in the front uh, where it's literally a trunk or a front uh, in front of the vehicle where these uh, uh, our customers can carry uh, their tools, the valuable equipment that they want to walk down. So there are several key features in the truck that are very important to this segment. Yes, it is different than more of a lifestyle segment, uh, but very important to our customers and a very substantial segment. It's an important distinction because the Ford F-150 really has been, particularly for the trade, as it were, for the construction workers, the, for the electricians, things like that, more than just lifestyle, as you say. As you look forward into the future, as far as you can, uh, when do you think there's a crossover point between the traditional Ford F-150 that you have there behind you uh, and the all-electric? So the, the transition to from the internal combustion trucks to the uh, all electric will take some time, but it is beginning. Uh, it is beginning right now. That's why we're making, uh, making this investment. And uh, the kind of unique things that the electric powertrain will bring to this customer base uh, is going to be, be very important to their businesses because it is lower cost of ownership. It is more versatile uh, and it is a lot of fun to drive. It will take some time though. Uh, it is not going to be an instantaneous switch. Uh, we will invest and we will see how, how the marketplace reacts and as the volume grows, uh, we'll grow our capacities with that, but it'll take a few years. That was my interview with Ford's president for North America and the International Markets Group. He is Kumar Galhotra. A programming note now, tomorrow on Balance of Power, we're gonna be joined by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. All this week, we've been taking a look at the key swing state of Arizona through the eyes of congressmen from both sides of the aisle and yesterday with the Secretary of State. Today, we welcome Jan Brewer, the 22nd governor of Arizona. Before her six years as chief executive there, Governor Brewer served in the state legislature and as chairman of the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors. So, Madam Governor, thank you so much for joining us. Give us your sense of Arizona in, at from 40,000 feet right now politically. There are a lot of reports that it is going from red to purple, that's sort of in between. Do you agree with that? Well, I think that possibly there's a good uh, chance that it is probably turning a little purple here in Arizona, which is very distressful uh, to us Republicans. But the bottom line is, is that uh, we've had a lot of people moving in out of California and other places coming to the great state of Arizona. So our demographics have really changed. I think that uh, we have to take that all into consideration when we're out there um, uh, spreading our message about conservatism because, you know, Arizona has always been a very conservative state. So I think that it probably will remain conservative. Um, I am hopeful of that, but we've got uh, big races on our hands. And I know that the election for the president is tightening and for our United States Senate, that race is very um, frightful. And uh, we've got to really get out there and spread our message. Well, I want to talk about that. Let's talk about the presidency for a second here, because there was a Monmouth poll out today that had the former Vice President Joe Biden four points ahead of President Trump. Do you, do you mistrust that poll? What tells you what's going on on the ground? Well, you know, we've heard and read a lot of polls over our lifetimes, <laughs> and they're not always correct. If you go back, you know, four years ago, they certainly weren't correct. I don't see the excitement here in Arizona uh, rising uh, with uh, with Joe Biden uh, and his campaign. I mean, he's just not here. He, there's just no activity going on as far as we see on the ground, as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, and I'm out in the public a lot because I'm 
retired. And so I'm out there talking to people all the time. There's a lot of excitement, and I think that it has been shown with President Trump. Uh, he's spent a lot of time out here. His administration has spent a lot of time out here. And the excitement is at a very, very high level. I don't think we can take it for granted. I think we're going to have to continue to work really, really hard. And we're going to have to really point out the differences uh, between the uh, Democrat uh, Vice President Biden and our President uh, Trump and what all that he has accomplished um, to uh, lead this state uh, forward. And there are a fair number of real policy differences, very stark, between these two candidates. Give us a sense of which ones are the most important. I mean, four years ago, immigration was a very big issue for President Trump. I, I have read and seen that perhaps, for example, in Maricopa County, which is so important and you know so well, that in fact the views may be shifting some of immigration. Is that your experience? I think that uh, people are uh, are shifting. I think that President Trump has done a good job. He answered the call. He listened to us. He got our borders secured. And we've seen, a, you know, it, it, the, the, the uh, illegal immigration um, kind of halting. And our border patrol has been well-funded. So that issue is uh, not uh, the number one issue anymore, I don't think, in Arizona. I think the number one issue, as always, is the economy and jobs and unemployment and certainly COVID-19. Uh, right now, I think people are very concerned about COVID-19, especially the older population. But I think that people want to know uh, that when we get past this pandemic, that we're going to see President Trump return to where we were uh, in the beginning and how he turned our country around with jobs and the economy and uh, the uh, bringing manufacturing back to our country, uh, you know, uh, doing what he did in Israel with the uh, with the, with the embassy. Uh, those kinds of things are very, very important to our population. So, so, Governor Brewer, as you suggest, the polling suggests that economy tied closely with COVID-19 really is uppermost in a lot of viewers and uh, voters' minds right across the country. What is President Trump's reputation in Arizona with how he's handled that? Because nationally, he does not get high marks. In, in regards to the economy, I don't know how anybody can't give him uh, high marks. Look what he's done. I mean, he's he's increased the job market. He's, uh, he's lowered taxes. Um, people were able to hire more people. And then the pandemic hit. So if we can return to all the good stuff that he was doing and, you know, and, and changing the, the MCUSA uh, from NAFTA and changing, you know, making making America first. Uh, that's what people in America want. They want us to take care of Americans first. Yeah, and Governor, you make a very good point. I want to be very clear because I put two things together. On um, the question of handling the economy, President Trump nationally gets, still has an edge. It's narrowing an edge over Vice President Biden, no question about that. But on COVID-19, the president does not get high marks. There's a lot of doubt about how he handled it. Is that true in Arizona? Well, I think that, you know, every this is such a... Uh, <laughs> a volatile issue. I think that people are afraid. I think people are scared. People don't get the enough information. There's so much conflicting information going out that, you know, that's when we all have to step up as we should and take care of ourselves and read into it and study it up ourselves. I think that um, it's just been a very complicated, ugly situation for everyone. But I think that President Trump has stepped up. I mean, he's really uh, brought uh, things into Arizona that we needed uh, during the pandemic quickly and fast, the ventilators, sending support, sending money, uh, you know, getting the unemployment up for people that were out of work, uh, you know, making it available for people to be able to go back to work so businesses can start slow, but, but to still keep it under control. You know, it's been hard. It has been hard. And Arizona was hard yet. I think we were the seventh hardest hit state in the country. So we really felt it here. We really, really yeah. felt it. But things are turning around. And if the vaccine yeah. is um, available shortly, I think yeah. that's going to really make a huge difference. And according to a, a POTUS, he right. says that it's going to happen soon. That's, so we're all looking forward to that. That's certainly what he says. No doubt about it. You mentioned briefly uh, the Senate race out there between Senator yeah. McSally on the one hand and Mark Kelly on the other. Two, I must note, veteran pilots, military pilots. Uh, the the polls have been rather stubborn in showing Mr. Kelly above Senator McSally. What do you think about that race? Well, I'm, di I'm very disappointed. I know, uh, you know, uh, Senator McSally very well, and I know she's a hard worker, and I know what she stands for, and she's a fighter, and she loves Arizona. I think that she's going to have to work uh, hard to 
to continue getting her message out there because she has served our state great. And, uh, you know, she's from southern Arizona and down there she had to be a little bit more liberal than we are up in the northern part of our state. So sometimes that's held against her, but we keep telling people and, you know, she's been very, very active. And I know Mark Kelly and I, you know, I just, what does he stand for? I don't know. I mean, he was an astronaut. That's about all that we know. And he's got a lot of money to spend on ads and uh, uh, independent expenditures to to lie about Martha McSally. So I'm hoping the people of Arizona that we can count on them to do their own research and do the right thing and elect uh, uh, Senator McSally uh, to the to the U.S. Senate. Um, you know, uh, it's unbelievable. We lost one of our Senate seats. We can't afford to lose another one. Yeah. What accounts for Mark Kelly's uh, uh, superior position in the polls? I, uh, I, I probably a lot of it comes from uh, his wife, from uh, from Gabby Giffords. Uh, you know, she was very beloved in Southern Arizona, and certainly when I was governor, and she was shot in that horrible accident down, not accident, but purposefully uh, happening down in Tucson. It was just you know so dramatic, and she became like a hero. But I served in the legislature with Gabby Giffords. She's a very nice person, but she's liberal. She's very liberal, and so is Mark Kelly, liberal. He's not going to stand up and um, be a conservative uh, voice for Arizona and for business and for, for the yeah. people. Well, we're all going to be watching Arizona come this election, both on the national level and also for the Senate. Thank you so much. Great to have you with Thank us. You. That's former Arizona Governor Jan Brewer. Coming up here, Balance of Power continues on Bloomberg Radio. In our second hour, we'll talk to health economist Catherine Baker of the University of Chicago about exactly what the problem is with the health uninsured in this country. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.